Good morning. Good morning. So welcome to the Center for Racial Dialogue and Communal Transformation. This is a speaker series, and today we're focused on immigration. Specifically, the overarching theme for this year was both harmony and hatred, and how do we live together in peace? And so if you think about the immigration debate and how polarizing it is, this is an effort really to have a conversation about what is our immigration policy, what is its impact on vulnerable communities, and we're where do we see ourselves moving into the future? And so with that, I welcome our president, Dr. Daisy Coco De Filippes, who will bring us opening remarks. Well, good morning. How wonderful. I couldn't, let me just explain. I have, I was told that I had been walking on a, a a left foot that has a fracture. <laughs> so I don't have a boot yet because he, he wrapped it up and he said, we'll give you a week because I didn't want it because I have so many activities that I don't want to miss. So I'm going to be quicker than I would have normally been because this is, if there's anything that is close to my heart, this is it, all of it, all of the wonderful work that Professor Feniers, Dean Santiago, Professor Taylor have been doing is really close to my heart. It is about that. Education is about learning to understand other people, to learn about other people, to see ourselves as the other. That's what education is about, and this is a really significant component. I'm so grateful to the speakers. I want to tell you, Angelica is our own beautiful product of the Danbury campus, and she's at UConn through a, a wonderful, we were able to, to get her a Fairfield County Community Foundation scholarship to continue. So happy, so proud of her, so much so that you will hear from her, not only today, but if you are graduating, she is, I'm going to announce it, but the heck. She's, <laughs> she's receiving the community medal. So I'm very uh, presidential medal, so I'm very, very happy. <laughs> and Doug Penn, thank you for your good work, your interest, your support, for taking time. Busy schedules come to us. So much appreciated. I have a folder with a number of things uh, collected through the years. I brought a few copies, and I'll leave them there. One of them, of course, this is today's paper. I think you're all in there, okay? Uh, this is the, uh, the um, I believe, the, the Connecticut Mirror, but it will be covered everywhere. There's a few copies of the press release from Governor Malloy's office, where actually part of people didn't even understand the process when these young people, these Connecticut students for a dream, began to advocate for support. And keep in mind that Connecticut has been generous in that dreamers pay in-state tuition, but they also don't have access to financial aid because they, they are not, um, uh, their status is not uh, uh, at this point uh, approved for that. But they do pay and have been paying, have been paid in their pay tuition. 15% of their tuition has gone to support the institution scholarships that go back to the students. So the whole idea was there was a past administration in the system office. I wrote an op-ed that they would not, they said you can't put this out until we figure out what the BR is doing. I do have here a copy of a couple of things that, first of all, what I wrote to the legislature in support of the Dreamers and DACA students getting access to these scholarships that are funded in part it's like, how can you have, uh, 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 you cannot have taxation without representation. If you don't have access to that money, then let the kids pay 85% of the tuition. That was my thought. But anyway, I have that. I'll leave some of them there, and those of you who want to read. So I have a copy of that. I also, on my testimony that went out, uh, and then my letter to the students that was published in some form by the Tamarack, post 
Trump election and the kind of protection that I said, just send everybody to my office. They're going to run over my body before they come out after one of my kids, basically. That was it. So those I'll leave here. And then I'm also a signatory and this President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration, which is a group the, of presidents and chancellors, a national group. There's about, I don't know how many of us there are, but there's 335 who have signed this. And I'm happy to say many of my colleagues in Connecticut also belong to that. So they talk about uh, that today is National Immigrant Resilience Day, right? So you're going to talk about that and how that came about. They talked about the DACA renewals and, and all of that. There's a whole bunch of things here that I probably sh should share with the campus community rather than read it here because I cannot stand up much longer. So I want to say that I'm so grateful for the conversation, for the information that will be shared. I, on a personal note, I came to this country when I was 13 years old. My parents had divorced when I was very young. I was two years old. And this is why Italian is my second language, English is the third. So my mom remarried when I was four to an Italian immigrant to the Dominican Republic. And he was determined to come to New York. So they finally got their papers, left us five children, with my mother's mother for a year. My grandmother and I, I was, my grandmother was, still is, even though she's been gone from this earth many years, my spiritual, my spiritual mother in every possible way. She was a school teacher. She loved poetry. A lot of what I am today is what I learned from her. So we were determined that I should not come to this country, that I would stay behind, because I really did not want to come. I wanted to stay with her. Let the other, when they finally went back a year later and we had our green cards, I said, let the others come, I stay. And then we went to visit my grandmother's sister, Tia Pastora, who was the philosopher of the family, who was the one, she was, uh, she sort of, I don't know how she got to become a mason there, but she was, uh, uh, in the Dominican Republic, a woman permitted it at that time. So we went to see her and she said, you can't do that. You cannot do that, Gabrielita, she said to my grandmother. Daisy belongs with her mother. A girl belongs with her mother. You have to let her go. So very reluctantly, I came to this country. So imagine this DACA students, for instance. What say do children have about what parents do? I got to, because I was the girl, even though I wasn't the oldest, I was the one that got to bring all the big x-rays and all of that. And even though I had attempted to learn English, I knew very little. And we navigated, I navigated the five of us through immigration. Uh, and then they were waiting us right outside for us. So that's an experience that I say, because I understand fully. And some of these children, the way they come into this country, because like we were, we were, I lived in a dictatorship for 30 years. It was after the death of the dictator that I got to come. But I remember not being able to walk the streets without tanks in the streets, knocking on people's doors, going in, they let you in. They let you in so you would avoid what was, what was going on. Not being able to go out to a movie theater without really checking all the area to make sure there were no bombs under your seat. We still went to the movies. The amazing thing is that we went, which is an unbelievable thing. But at any rate, more on that later, another time, because there's a lot that I have to say about that and about being bilingual in the Dominican Republic and living in the house of an Italian in the Dominican Republic that also had its challenges there with the neighbors. But that's another story. All right. So, so let's just look at each other and say, let's just look for kindred spirits, people who share our values, whatever the language, whatever the color, whatever the age, whatever the sexual uh, uh, gender reality. That's what it is. It's about being able to get along. Everything from any business you go into is about being able to talk with people, to respect people, to, to disagree respectfully, to listen to things you don't want to hear, and then hope that others will listen to you 
when you have your piece to say. So thank you, everybody. I am so looking forward to this presentation. Mil gracias y bendiciones. And I'll leave you. And so before we get into the panel discussion, we will have Dean Antonio Santiago from our Danbury campus present the biographies of each of our distinguished panelists. Antonio? Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. So first off, Douglas Penn. I graduated of the University of Denver, uh, admitted to practice law in Connecticut and Colorado. Mr. Penn has practiced in the field of immigration and naturalization law since 1997. In February 2010, he opened his own firm in Stanford, Connecticut, where he continues to focus his practice solely on immigration matters. Mr. Penn frequently speaks to community groups on immigration law and policy. He has been a speaker at immigration law conferences at the state and national levels and has guest lectured on business immigration at Quinnipiac University School of Law and at University of Connecticut School of Law. Mr. Penn has been named in Best Lawyers in America and has been rated in Martindale Hubble as distinguished in the field of immigration and nationalization law. He is a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and the Connecticut Bar Association. He is a past chair of the Connecticut <laughs> chapter of AILA. He has served on several national committees, I'm sorry, committees of AILA, including the Professionalism and Ethics Committee and the Business Immigration Committee. Currently, Mr. Penn is the chair of the Media and Advocacy Committee of the Connecticut chapter of AILA. Ladies and gentlemen, Douglas Penn. Our second panelist, Angelica Hidrobo, a community organizer and activist. She represents the voices of undocumented immigrants through community organizations such as Connecticut Students for a Dream and United We Dream. For the, past, for the past four years, she has been committed to the work of the immigration rights movement. She advocates for educational equality, comprehensive immigration reform, deferred action for childhood arrivals, also known as DACA, and other social justice issues. Through her work, she's been able to advocate, empower, and educate undocumented students at high schools and colleges. She has hosted community meetings such as Know Your Rights, college access program workshops, and leadership skills training throughout the Danbury area. Her motivation is to change racist, anti-immigrant, and xenophobic policies that hurt communities of color. She has participated in town hall meetings, meetings at the Board of Education to advocate for new policies and laws that will help, commu help communities of color live without fear and with dignity. A 2016 MVCC graduate in liberal arts and sciences, Ms. Hidrovo is currently attending the University of Connecticut while pursuing a bachelor's degree in psychological science with a minor in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Her goal is to start her own nonprofit organization that provides mental health support and education to communities of color. Ladies and gentlemen, Angelica Hidrovo. Okay, so my personality, it's really hard for me to sit down. And I've been told that I gesture wildly. So I'm gonna get up and talk. Um, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna spend about 15 minutes talking about the architecture of immigration law in the United States. Because the reality is Americans don't get our own system. We just don't understand it. So I'm gonna explain it a little bit, go through a little bit of the history very quickly, go through the current system, and um, then I'll hand it over to Angie, and that's probably 15 minutes. So everything you need to know about immigration law in 15 minutes. The current system was set up in 1952. So think about that. That is actually really old. It's two generations away now. It was set up in a time when what we were worried about, communism. It was set up in a time where unions actually meant something. They were very powerful. So a lot of the way our system was set up is based on the thought processes, what the US thought back then. We set up a sponsorship-based system, which is to say most people come here because somebody here or an organization here wants them here. There's no such, with some exceptions, there is no such thing as self-sponsorship. There's also no such thing as the good guy visa. 
I'll hear people come into my office and they'll say, famously, this is actually a true story. A woman came into my office. She had petitioned for her housekeeper because her housekeeper was just an extraordinary person. It was a single mom, took care of her child. It was just be, would be an incredible asset to the United States. And she came to my office because we got the request for evidence saying, well, okay, what national publications has she been in? Has she participated as a judge in any you know, meritorious work? You know, they were asking for extraordinary, uh, she had filed for an extraordinary alien petition thinking and thinking, well, this person's extraordinary. We couldn't care less. That's just not how our system works. We divide the world into four categories. United States citizens, permanent residents, and people who are other people who are lawfully here, undocumented and temporary, well, permanent residents, temporary people who are here lawfully on temporary visas or temporary statuses, and undocumented immigrants. A little bit above that, we're very self-centered. There's us and there's them, and they want to be us. And if they want to be us, that's a reason to keep them out. That sounds really funny, but that is actually how our system thinks. So when we talk about those four groups of people, US citizens, real easy way, you're a US citizen by birth, you're a US citizen by naturalization, that's it. Theoretically, it's an act of Congress. You can imagine how many people have become citizens by act of Congress. It doesn't happen. Lawful permanent residents. These are people who have an unrestricted right to live here and work wherever they want forever. They get green card, these are green card holders. They are eligible to apply for citizenship after, for the most part, five years. There are some exceptions, but if you think about five years. Once they become US citizens, they is us. They're us. There's no difference between a US citizen who is naturalized and a US citizen who was born. That's one of the things that actually we do remarkably well as a country, better than almost any other country in the world. The thing with permanent residents, they only get green cards by being sponsored. There are exceptions, but that's the general rule, and everyone forgets that general rule. The other thing we forget is we are a very unforgiving system. Once you are here out of status, 180 days, a little bit under six months, there is no mechanism to get the green card here. There is no fix, even if you have a sponsorship. Did I just, oh, there it is. Even if you're sponsored, there is no fix. There are exceptions, and everyone remembers the exception, because that's the rule. The big exception is, I came in on a visa and I'm married to a US citizen. But we have to remember, that's the exception. The rule is, once you've messed up, you're done. Period. Forget about it. Non-immigrant visa holders, there's a whole range of categories. There's literally A through V visas, and then there's subcategories in there. They're very specialized. And the big thing to remember is, again, usually someone here has brought that person here for a specific purpose for a limited time. That time period may be very long, it may be extendable, but nonetheless, it is a limited time. An example, student visas. You can come in here to go to school. Not work, to go to school. And not only just any school, one school. If you want to change schools, you have to get permission from USCIS. We'll talk a little bit about acronyms in a moment. It is possible, in some cases, to go from a non-immigrant visa those temporary visas, to a green card. Again, if you're sponsored, there is very few ways for someone to move their, on their own accord from one category to another category, from non-immigrant visa to immigrant visa. Now we move on to undocumented immigrants. There, these come in three flavors, three different types of people. There are people who enter the United States without a visa improperly. In, in, in immigration terms, we call them EWIs, entries without inspection. Southern border is kind of typically what we think of. There are also people who overstay their visas. They've come in on a visa that has a limited time period, tourist visa six months, work visa three years, something like that, and they, stay over, they overstay their visa. 
That is actually the single largest place of undocumented immigrant growth currently. Ever since 2008, border crossings have basically been flat. The entries without inspection, really that's not happening anymore, despite what you hear. The third category are people who violate the terms of their status. And that's actually really easy to do. If you're here on a work visa and you lose your job, guess what? You are now out of status. There are, some, again, some exceptions to it, but that's the general rule. On some work visas, if your company changes owners, you have now lost your status. If you're on a temporary work visa and you bring your spouse here, you two, the two of you get divorced, your spouse is now an undocumented immigrant the day of the divorce. So we're, again, we're a very harsh system, so it's really easy to become undocumented. And once you're in that undocumented category, it's very difficult to fix things. So that's kind of the brief overview of our system. Things that you'll hear about. You'll hear people talk about USCIS. That's United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. After 9-11, the old Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS, broke up. It was brought into the Department of Homeland Security and broken into three different agencies. USCIS is the benefits agency. They're the people who give out, who naturalize people. They're the people who issue green cards. They're the people who issue the non-immigrant visas that require sponsorship. The easy way to remember them is if you mispronounce the C. Us kiss. Kisses are nice things, generally speaking. The second agency is ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The easy way to think about them, they're cold. These are, these are the cops. These are the people who do the raids. These are the people who arrest people. These are the people who show up in courthouses to take people into custody. They're the cops. The final agency is Customs and Border Protection, CBP. The easy way to remember them is they don't make any sense. Because um, there's no mnemonic for CBP. There just isn't. But these are the Border Patrol agents, and these are also the inspectors at the ports of entry when you fly into the United States or if you enter through a land port or a seaport. So that's, real briefly, the overview of our immigration system. It is built on, a, on what our concerns were six, over 60 years ago. It was the, the number, numerical limits that are put on there, and we do put numerical limits on everything. You'll hear about H-1B visas sometimes in the press, work visas. There are 85,000 work visas. On a low year, this year was a low year, there were over 195,000 petitions for those 85,000 slots. So it's a lottery so that the employer can hire someone starting in October. It's hit the first five days of the, the season being open. Immigrant visas, we break up people according to category and we put caps on them. Immediate relatives of a US citizen are kind of like if you think of getting on a plane and they're uniformed to military and children traveling with small, or people traveling with small children and people who need extra time getting on the plane, those are immediate relatives of US citizens. Parents, spouses, and minor children. Everyone else breaks into different categories, first preference, second preference, third preference. No country can take more than 6% of all immigrant visas. So if you think about it for sibling petitions or um, unskilled worker petitions, that means no country gets more than 1,000 immigrant visas per year. India gets the same number as Iceland. Chad gets the same number as China. So the backlogs for India and China are almost generational now. They, you know, you're looking at 10 years plus easily, and it could be longer. And that doesn't matter if the person has an advanced degree. That doesn't matter necessarily how close the relationship, the family relationship is. This is all based on our population from 50, 60 years ago. One of the interesting things about immigration generally, worldwide, only about 10% of the worldwide population actually immigrates from one country to another. It's very rare. So you think of the, um, the president, she's unique, one in 10. Angie, one in 10. These are really unique people. It takes a huge amount of internal wherewithal to be able to change everything. 
to change your environment. That's really unusual. Instead of putting our cap on the 10% number, we put a numerical cap on it. The United States population has grown. We have several hundred million people in the United States. Immigration, there's roughly about a million people who come into the United States every year who immigrate into the United States. Less than 1% of our population comes in as immigrants. There are about 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States right now. Easily half of them have no way to fix their status. No matter how good they are, no matter how they're contributing to their society, no matter how integrated they are into the United States, there is no fix. And we can't deport our way out of this. We spend roughly, I think it's about $16 billion on immigration enforcement. To put that in perspective, actually, I take that back. The 16, um, it's actually closer to $19 billion on immigration enforcement. That is more than what we spend on all other federal law enforcement combined. Immigration enforcement gets all of the money. They account for a huge chunk of it. More than Secret Service, FBI, DEA, ATF combined. At their height, under President Obama, when he was the deporter in chief, he was deporting about 400,000 people a year. At that rate, if you do the math, it's going to take us 22 years to deport everyone. That's not a fix. It just isn't. And the attorney in me, you know, I, I, I get some of the arguments about, you know, people should put, get in line and nobody should jump the line and anything like that. Any attorney who does litigation and any judge will tell you the role is to settle the cases that you can settle. There are people who are decent people who have fallen out of status, whether it was you know, intentional or whether it was done to them, in effect. We have to fix it. And at some point, we just have to be pragmatic about it. And that, you know, that sounds, that can be kind of, well, some people will get very nervous about that. But enforcing our way out of it is incredibly expensive, going to take forever, and it isn't going to work anyway. And it's inhuman. So I think I'll put that at the end of my remarks, and I'll hand this over to Angie. Faces. Uh, Santiago, that the Nova students of the Denver campus mentioned before, my name is Angelica. You can call me Angie Hidrobo. Um, I will be talking, I will be mentioning about my story and also the work that I do and some exciting news um, that happened yesterday at Conrico's Capital. Um, so I came here when I was 12 years old with my two parents and younger siblings. Uh, my mom a very persevering, resilient woman who was always determined and to come here, to come to the United States, to leave the American dream, to give my brothers, my family, everything that she couldn't have, uh, meaning uh, finan a good financial status, like being able to have a house, being able to be stable um, and build something. Right. Uh, also, she really wanted us to pursue our academic uh, dreams, to go to college, to be successful. Whatever, like you, I think uh, we know that our moms what they what they don't want from us, right? What they they are not thinking to give us, right? Because they are always thinking to give us the best. Our parents are has been always there to motivate us, to keep pushing for us, and to make windows and doors for us. So that's what my mom and my dad were trying to make for my family. So we arrived here at the United States when I was 12, 2018. I'm 22 now. Um, and we overstayed our visas. Um, so what happened is that um, after six months, we had no legal status, as Penn mentioned before. Um, I, I live in Denver, and I started going to middle school, 
and my brothers also start going to elementary school. So we were really happy, really excited to learn a new language, to be part of this country, to this of this community. Uh, but even though we had really beautiful dreams and hopes, many times uh, we felt that we didn't belong here. Um, and and coming to to real realization that one day my parents will be a stop. One day, uh, my my dad could uh, be working. I mean, could be driving to work and be a stop. Um, and maybe the porter meant a lot for us. So throughout my middle school years and my high school years. Me and my brothers and obviously my whole family live in, in fear, in fear of deportation, right? Because like when you come home, you expect your mom and your dad to be there. Um, but no, the things were more difficult for us because like my mom used to tell us, make sure that you don't share your status with anyone. Make sure you don't mention that um, you don't have papers. Make sure that uh, no one knows at your school. Because uh, you don't know people, people can be mean, people can be evil, and uh, and we don't really know how we will be approaching these problems if something happens to us, right? So for me, as as a young lady, I was uh, really scared, really scared of thinking that I may come home and not finding my parents anymore, or coming home and uh, thinking that my brothers and I will be put in foster um, homes. So that was a really difficult moment for my family and I until I went to high school and, you know, I was like really passionate about um, my my subjects and I was like, I want to be the best. I really want to go to school. I really want to uh, graduate and, um, and have that degree. So in my years of high school, I was a really good student. I had a really good GPA. I was part of the National Honor uh, Society uh, clubs at Denbury High School, and, um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think everything was going with the flow. Um, I had friends, I went out to the movies, I was uh, helping my parents, I worked uh, in my junior year at this uh, cell phone um, store, so I was, you know, really trying to, to be what I wanted to be. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what happened is that at the end of my high school years, um, at the end of my high school year, my senior year, I find out that things were more difficult and harder for undocumented students to go to college. So I started to apply for schools, for scholarships, and for FAFSA. And unfortunately, um, I did not receive any federal financial aid because I needed a social security number to, to be eligible to count as one of of the students who will be receiving something. Um, I applied for many, many schools and many scholarships. I got accepted on many schools. Unfortunately, the scholarships that I want to apply for um, require citizenship or a resident status, which I didn't have, which I don't have still at the moment. Um, so what happened is that I remember clearly sitting down on my at the kitchen table and, you know, being devastated, not knowing what else could I do because I have done everything that I could, right? I joined all the clubs at high school. I was really, really um, looking forward to go to a university and finish a degree. Um, so what happened is that uh, I decided to not give up. I decided to to keep working and to start at a community college. So that's why I enrolled in the Nagata campus at Denbury. And um, I decided to take two jobs at a time and finish the school part-time. So as Santiago also mentioned, I'm a graduate from Nagata um, the year 2016. Uh, but what also helped me realize that I was living in the shadows was when I uh, met the founders of C40, Connecticut Students for a Dream. Um, they started doing some info sessions at the high school that I went and also at many other colleges and I started like being involved with them, right? And uh, I, start, I started feeling like I had a community, that I had people behind me that care about me and people that share my same um, experiences going through high school, going to college and how hard that has been for us. So... 
<clears throat> I decided to, to start, you know, like stepping into my leadership and sharing my story. Because if I didn't, no one else was going to. And our stories, we many times don't realize how powerful our stories are until we share them. Um, so what happened is that uh, I started doing many, many organizing and uh, uh, policy work with Connecticut Students for a Dream. In 2011, we partnered up with many organizations, with many faith organizations, the clergy, and we passed in, in state tuition, meaning that uh, undocumented students who went to the four years of high school could have, uh, instead, I mean, uh, could have benefit from uh, uh, not out of state tuition, but in state tuition. Because before 2010, um, like even uh, though many undocumented students have lived in the state of Connecticut for 10, 15 years, they were, they were still charged with out-of-state tuition. So um, that was a huge win for the undocumented students who were behind pushing the legislators, uh, trying to make a change for others. And, and we got it. It was really exciting. It was implemented in 2012. Years later, um, we tried to change the requirements. So now it's only two years of high school or your GED. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we also started to, you know, um, making sure that we were heard. So we started working, working with the national organization United We Dream. Uh, uh, that is this, that they're, they're oh, I can speak today. Um, that they are established in Washington D.C. So we start going up to Washington D.C. and talking to legislators and trying to pass the Dream Act, right? And immigration reform for all undocumented students and all undocumented parents who have been in the United States. So unfortunately, that failed also 2013. Um, and what happened is that we started thinking about what can we do locally? What can we change in, on, in our home? So even though we got in-state tuition, we knew that going to college was still hard. I mean, like for anyone, it's really hard to pay. It's a really huge amount of money that we put into the system to go to college. So uh, we did our, re our research and we partnered up with a YRAC team, the Yale Law Students, and we wrote a bill uh, for undocumented students being able to access to institutional financial aid, a pool of money that all students, when they pay tuition, put into, but unfortunately undocumented students are the only ones who are not receiving anything back. And it's only 15% of your tuition um, who is being, uh, who is being uh, collected at the end of the year. Um, so we decided that that was unfair, that was unjust, that we have been putting this money into the system and, uh, and not receiving anything back. So. We start our legislative process again at the Capitol in, in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so we attend to many roundtable meetings, many um, press conferences. We have been rallying and taking and doing um, office takeovers because uh, we wanted to make sure that our voices were heard, that we matter, and this is important. Everything like that we have been doing is to equalize access for all students, regardless of their immigration status. So um, yesterday, after five years of, uh, of fighting uh, for financial aid, we have passed both the Senate and the House of Representatives, and this is huge. And this is huge, not only for myself, but for all the undocumented students that are really driving and looking forward to go to school. Now they're gonna be able to receive something back, to have equal access to these funds of money that, they, that we were not before. Also, Connecticut Students for a Dream is a, a statewide nonprofit organization that advocates, empowers, and um, 
change for pol change I mean fights for policies like the one that I just mentioned before. Um, so we have different regional teams. I'm the Denver regional organizer in Denver, um, and many of our roles are not only you know to change policies, but also to empower undocumented youth. Because coming out of the sh shadows is not easy. Hearing your peers call other people illegal is not easy. And I know I was, I was when I was in high school, I was super ashamed of people. No one ever called me an illegal because I never shared my status with anyone. But I remember my, my, my friends and other people calling, you know, is speaking dominant students illegal. And that was and that was really degrading and dehumanizing um, someone who was coming from another country just to have a better life. Um, so this is me. I have been working with C4D since I'm 17, so it has been five years. Um, I believe now we're gonna pass to, to you, right? And we're gonna do Q and A's. So thank you, Angelica and Attorney Penn, for the overall overview of the um, our immigration law and our policy. Some of those facts were surprising, even to me. Um, I hope my students were listening very carefully to Angie's story, because all semester I've been telling you all to get passionate about something. Right, And so we talked about environmental law and Standing Rock and um, cigarette companies and the water crisis. And now we've had a conversation about immigration. And we see the power that comes from being organized and believing that you can make a difference in your community. So when we had this conversation, many of you said, oh, no, that's not possible. But Angie stands as a reminder that it absolutely is. And then Attorney Penn is in the, in the courthouse fighting alongside. And so I'm going to open it up to questions. I have a list of questions, but I want to be respectful of the audience. And so if you have questions for our panelists at this time, please feel free to ask. Anthony? I'm going to hold this. Um, it's kind of a hard question to answer because the laws often are very, very, are so radically different, it's hard to compare. Um, conceptually, the concepts tend to be the same, but for example, Saudi Arabia is incredibly strict. When they talk about their undocumented immigrants, they're talking about adult men who are born of Saudi women who married non-Saudi men. That's their illegal immigration population. And they are there for the same reason undocumented immigrants are here. They want to take advantage of the social security, social services. They don't understand Saudi culture, all those things. That's, but that's Saudi Arabia. Um, Germany does not allow their citizens to become citizens of other countries unless they get the German uh, government to approve it first. Um, so... Canada, on the other hand, has a self-sponsorship-based system. So it's a point system, kind of uh, where people come there and they can immigrate fairly easily. We're probably somewhere in the middle. Um, our system, the, the big change that our system went through was in 97, or 1996, I should say. It went into effect in 97. And that's where we really became very penalty-oriented so that it used to be that there were fixes. If someone was, fell out of status, there was a way to eventually resolve it. In, 90, in 96, we kind of took a lot of that, those things away, and we made a lot of things, again, retroactive in a way that would shock a, lot of, um, shock a lot of people who think that we believe in due process in the United States. Yes? The, 
the concept, it's Americans thinking like Americans. Um, the, the, and let me explain that. So the concept was that we would make it so hard for people to come here undocumented or to live here undocumented that they would go home. And before 96, what you tended to see were a lot of people crossing the border back and forth. I remember the, when I first started practicing in 97, I had a client and I asked him, how many times have you crossed the border? And he was like, um, I actually don't remember. Um, it took me like 21 tries this last week, this last time to get in in the space of a week. Um, that was, so the concept was that people, we'd make it so hard people would not come in or they would go home. What we ended up really doing was having people come here and then stay. Because it was so hard to cross the border, they did the logical thing. Cross it once and then don't go. So the population started to grow that way. Um, there was an old law called 245I where people could pay a thousand, if they had a path to get a green card, an employer wanted to sponsor them or a family member could sponsor them, they could pay a fine, a thousand dollar fine, and do the process here. That went away in 98, was briefly renewed in 2000, went away for good in 2001. Um, before 96, you could go home and fix your status. So for example, you know that the, if you're here 180 days, there's no way to fix it. The reason that's the case is there's a, a, things called three and 10 year bars. If you're out of status for 180 days and you go home for any reason, including to get your green card, you don't come back for three years. If you're out of status a whole year, and you go home for any reason, including to get your green card, you don't come back for 10 years, which is basically a case killer. That didn't exist before 1996. So a lot of times people would, you know, they'd have a family member who would sponsor them or an employer who would be willing to sponsor them. They would go home, finish the processing there, come back. All of that went away. So kind of the, the, val the outlet valves that existed before 96 we deliberately destroyed thinking that people would not be people. Yes, in the back. Are the sponsorship requirements pretty consistent for any, anyone who's being sponsored? Is it, is it generally like the same requirements across the board? Well, I'm sorry, can, may I stand up? I, it's hard for me to sit this long. Um, I have a standing desk at, my, at home, at my office. Um, so there are two main ways to sponsor, family-based and employment-based. Family-based is all based on relationship. Parent, spouse, child, or sibling. Those are the people who can sponsor. And if you're a US citizen, you can sponsor your parents, your spouse, your children, your siblings. And there are caps on how many come in. So siblings, it takes 16 years before you'll be able to come to the United States. For parents of a US citizen, it's immediate relative, it takes about a year. Um, if you're a permanent resident, a green card holder, you can sponsor your spouse, your minor children, or your adult children as long as they're not married. And that takes pretty typically about five to seven years. And if you're out of status here during that time, it doesn't work. That's the family side. The employment side, again, we rank people. So you have you know, high-skilled workers, people with advanced degrees, exceptional alien, except, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use the word alien because that's how the statute phrases it, but exceptional people, um, the Brishnikovs, the Einsteins of the world, the people who you either know their name or you recognize what they did. For example, I had represented a guy who won the bronze medal in badminton. He got his green card. We, you know, we, we, know what, we know what he did. Um, so you know, we rank those people. And again, there are limits on how many can come through. So in theory, any employer can sponsor any employee. But again, if that person's out of status, the only way to fix it is to go back home. And then they, if they're not in good status, things fall apart. A green card process through <coughs> employment can take anywhere from a year to 10 to 15 years again, depending upon the category. 
there's a lot of work that has to be done during that time period, again, depending on the category, so it's not exactly consistent. Every permanent resident has to be admissible to the United States. No criminal record, no bad immigration history, no contacts with terrorism, no um, communicable health diseases, they're not gonna be public charges because they're not eligible for any federal public benefits. Um, so there's all, everyone has to go through that process, but if you think about it, that's the end of the game. That the foundation is the sponsorship, and that changes a lot from one category to another category. In the back. So, um, what happens to the people that come from other countries due to a crisis like Syria or Somalia? They come here under temporary protected status. And let's say they stay here for six, seven, eight years. So, they start their life from scratch, basically, again. Uh, what happens after they assumably say, oh, your country's fixed now, you can do they just Let's talk a little bit, I, I, I jumped, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not trying to dominate. <laughs> but so, um, but so let's talk about humanitarian modes of coming here. And that would be refugees, asylees, and temporary protected status. Um, refugees are people who go through all the processing overseas. They're in refugee camps, they have to register with the United Nations, then they are placed in a country. And the US might be one of those countries. They're allowed to live here forever. They're allowed to become permanent residents. They will eventually become citizens um, you know, as they go through that normal process. Asylees are people who basically present themselves at the border or within one year of coming in and saying, I, I need, you know, I'm fleeing a really bad situation back home. These are actually very difficult cases, but assuming they win their case, they will be able to be here, they'll be able to live here forever, they'll have a path to permanent residence and eventually to green cards. Honestly, about one in three people, well, no, one in 10 who are unrepresented will get asylum status. It flips to maybe three out of four to nine out of 10 will get their asylum status if they are if they're, uh, have access to legal representation. Um, we're very, very hard on asylum. Temporary protected status is a little bit different. And you'll hear temporary protected status in the news a lot because of Haiti, El Salvador, Guatemala, and most recently, Nepal. This administration is terminating all the TPSs. Um, when TPS ends, the person's status ends. And ostensibly, they are now subject to removal, deportation. And it doesn't matter how long they've been here. The so true story, the you know little old lady who came in with her housekeeper who was the extraordinary person. That person was from one of the TPS countries. She had been here so long, her child had become her child had been born here and grew up. He, he was an adult. We were eventually able to straighten out her status, and she now has a green card because of that. But it was to a large degree a series of lucky events over the course of 20 years of TPS. A lot of clients, when TPS ends, they're done. In theory, they, are going, they will either go home voluntarily or the administration will start a deportation case against them. We don't care about kids, and I'm, and I'm sorry, real bluntly, we don't care about kids. Um, we don't care about school. We kind of care about spouses, maybe, um, and that's about it. More examples that I could give of that, um, a lot of people, if they're lucky and have been kind of thinking about things, they will be able to take the TPS time to build a bridge, but it really is, everything has to fall into the right place at the right time. And in a lot of cases, that doesn't work. Um, so, an example. And this is actually for DACA people too. Um, and what Angie didn't say is that there was a judge two days ago who basically said, you know, 
USCIS has to start accepting new DACA applications. We'll see how that plays out because the government has 90 days to respond. But the same concept is true with DACA. TPS people and DACA people have gone through background checks every 18 months to two years. They're known quantities. They have been here, in some cases, a decade, two decades. They're integrated in the United States. If Angie didn't tell you what her status was, how many of you would have guessed it? Honestly, none of us. There is no path. When this ends, they're done. That ends up being a really scary statement if you think about it. There really is, there are exceptions. And we start going through all the exceptions trying to figure it out. But the reality is, you could have been here 10 years, you could have been here 20 years, you could have grandchildren who are US citizens, and depending on things that may have happened real early on, there is no fix. You hear about those people who are being, who are taking sanctuary in churches, or who, you know, and, and they'll say, you know, they've been here 10 years, they have US citizen children, whatever. There is no fix in a lot of those cases. Are there any other questions from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> How many times are you going to get to ask an attorney questions and he's not going to charge you after that? <laughs> Um, so with the H-1Bs, the 85,000, it has changed sometimes. Originally there was no cap. In the 90s they put 65,000 on it because that sounded like a good number. What's the $65,000 question? I don't know, I guess the answer is H-1B. Um, in the early, that was sufficient through most of the 90s. It started to become insufficient at the end of the 90s. Um, in early 2000, and, uh, early 2000, 2001, the number briefly went up to 195,000. And at the time, that was adequate. Um, it eventually went away, the law sunsetted. Um, then they added a $20,000 or 20,000 um, exemption for people with US master's degrees. So that's why we have the 85,000. And when the economy tanked in 2008, that number again became adequate for a while. Um, a couple of years ago, because as if the economy has gotten better, you know, um, two years ago, three years ago, we were having about a quarter of a million people apply for that 85,000 slot. So it was about a one three. And now, for a variety of reasons, it's about 190,000 people applied. Isaiah? Sure. So th 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 there are a couple different ways that it can work. If they pick you up, they hold you in detention until you have a, a bond hearing. It, it ends up feeling a little bit like criminal court, only it's criminal court when there's no right to counsel, rules of evidence don't apply, and they can change the charging document at any time. And offenses are retroactive. So you end up having a bond hearing, then you have a pleading hearing that's called a master calendar hearing. And then there's an individual hearing where it's just actually the trial. That's if you're picked up. If you're not picked up, they can start a deportation case with a letter that's mailed by regular mail. Greetings, you are now in deportation. You are commanded to show up in front of an immigration judge on a date and time to be determined. And then a little bit later, they'll give you that date. Um, so it, will fe it feels like a criminal trial. It isn't exactly, but it feels like one. Um, at the end of the hearing, if you don't show up, if you miss a hearing, they order you deported in absentia. And there's very limited ability to reopen that. If um, at the end of the process, if you lose, then they will issue what's called a bag and baggage letter. And the idea is you're gonna show up with your luggage and they will put you on the plane and send you home. Um, it, 
depending upon your criminal record, they will take you into custody and they will hold you the entire time. So it's not, it, 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 unless you have an outstanding order, they will not, it's not a pick you up, grab you, and put you on the next plane. There's still a process. It's just not really due. Undocumented workers? Who have, who have fake, fake social security numbers. And they work and they pay taxes under this fake name. How, how much in danger are these businesses now under the new administration? Um, and will, I heard that INS and the IRS, they don't really get along, so they never really double check. So it's been. You know, the, the IRS does not cooperate with anyone. And that includes the U.S. <laughs> you, you, you'd laugh, but it's true. The, the IRS doesn't even cooperate with the U.S. government. Um, and, and I mean that seriously. I, uh, for, I interned with the Security and Exchange Commission, and the IRS was investigating one of the people that we were investigating. The IRS came in and took the whole file and said, thank you very much. And I asked the attorney, are we ever going to find out what happened? He says, no, we won't. Um, and, and USCIS is the same thing. They hate it when the IRS gets involved because they take the whole file and they never find out anything. Um, so, the IRS just wants their money. That's really what it comes down to. Um, hiring people with, who, in theory, every employer completes an I-9 for every employee, and the employee has to show documentation that they're authorized to work. If you do not complete I-9s, if you have a knowing hire of an undocumented worker, you are subject to fines. If you get caught enough times, you are subject to criminal offenses. Um, different administrations have enforced this differently. The Obama administration really kind of said, let's fine the employers, you know, make them fire the people that they have and find the bejesums out of them. Um, the Bush administration loved really big, splashy raids and used a lot of um, other laws to criminally prosecute people. And they did some really amazing things that attorneys would balk at. You know, mass trials where everyone pled guilty, like they'd have all of you in the room, and do you all, do you, did you all you know, plead guilty to document fraud? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. You're all deported. And you're, con you know, you're convicted and deported. Thank you very much. Um, this administration is beefing up raids, and they're going to be beefing up I-9 audits. Um, it takes a little bit of time to ramp that up. And we'll see how that plays out. The, the laws, one of the things that we, I didn't talk a whole lot about, the law, the biggest basic architecture was built in 1952. The last major change was in 1996. Everything that's happened since then, DACA, the current, the current, the travel ban, the termination of TPS, the termination of DACA, the, you know, uh, hire American, buy, Amer buy American, hire American, all that stuff. That's just the president signing an order. It can change on a dime, and it's all based on the, the architecture that was set decades ago. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. When they do audits for the I-9s, um, as long as the employer submits the paperwork, the employer could I will tell you the only employer I ever found who did perfect I-9s had close to 100% undocumented workforce. <laughs> and, and he had been caught three times with his hands in the cookie jar, as it were, with uh, undocumented workforce. And it turns out that his HR manager was, and this is incredibly rare, an undocumented immigrant from Cuba. Um, it's almost impossible to be undocumented from Cuba, but this guy pulled it off. Um, <laughs> So um, I will tell you, the employers are going to be fined because they, they, they will mess up. It just happens. And now I, I want to thank, I want to be respectful of those who have classes at, at 1245, and, and this class ends at 1230. And 
we will be here to answer questions. We also have free soup. So if you can stay, have soup. If not, take a bowl. You can take it to go. We have containers for you to take it to go as well. And I thank you all for coming. And I'm very glad I didn't have to use my questions. Thank you, Doug and Angie.